from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here. Um, and this is a special treat today because we're welcoming back um, one of the uh, former fellows um, in the Kluge Center, uh, Nellie LaHood to talk about uh, her book, The Jihadi's Path to Self-Destruction. This is a book that, um, Nellie, I guess you were doing, we were researching this in uh, 2005 when she was uh, one of, a, we had a special program, Rockefeller Fellows in Islamic Studies, um, and Dr. LaHood was one of our Rockefeller Fellows. Uh, before we uh, begin, I, if you have a, a cell phone or a, other electronic equipment, if you would please um, turn that off so it doesn't interfere with the speaker and also with the sound system. Um, I'll say a few brief words about the Kluge Center itself. The center promotes advanced research in the collections of the library. It was established through a very uh, generous gift by John W. Kluge um, in 2000. Um, his hope was to bring together some of the world's best thinkers uh, and the doers, represented by sort of Congress across the street, um, by uh, scholars and statesmen and legislators. The center uh, supports um, some of the world's most accomplished senior scholars and some of the most uh, promising junior scholars. Um, and I'll say with Dr. LaHood, the promise has been realized because <laughs> here she is with this wonderful book. Um, we also provide um, lectures such as this one, small conferences, symposia, um, et cetera. You can find out more about the Kluge Center by going to the library's webpage. It's a little more complicated than it used to be, but if on the front side of the page, on the right-hand side, you'll see the Kluge Center you go to our web page with a click and then go to the bottom of the page and you can get email announcements of upcoming events. Um, <clears throat> but now let's turn to the subject and the speaker uh, that brings us here today. Uh, Dr. LaHood is currently associate professor with the Combating Terrorism Center in the Department of Social Sciences at the U.S. Mil Military Academy, uh, West Point. Uh, prior to joining West Point, she was an assistant professor of political theory, including Islamic political thought at Goucher College. Uh, Dr. LaHood's publications include the book, Political Thought in Islam, A Study of Intellectual Boundaries uh, from 2005, and she co-edited with uh, Dr. A.J. Johns um, another book called Islam and World Politics. And today she's here to discuss um, her new book. Uh, <clears throat> a specialist, uh, Dr. Thomas Heghama, uh, who focuses on the study of violent Islamism um, and is a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment in Oslo, um, has said this of Dr. LaHood's work. She is, quote, one of the finest scholars of jihadi ideology around. Her book is a brilliant dissection of contemporary jihadi discourse with an original twist, namely an in-depth comparison of modern jihadism with early Karijism, which provides an interesting historical analogy. She argues convincingly that the, uh, re the sort of reflexes of the religious enforcer of contemporary militants, um, or sorry, yeah, that that tendency um, will lead to internal fragmentation and political marginalization. So please welcome uh, Dr. Nellie LaHood.
Thank you, Carolyn, for uh, this very generous introduction. Um, let me say first that I'm delighted to be back in this stately building. I was very privileged uh, to have been a Rockefeller Fellow in Islamic Studies uh, at the Kluge Center in 2005. Um, my friend and colleague, Josh Saliba, who was a senior fellow here at the same time, used to say that this, is, that this place is the closest thing to being in paradise. We submit a list of dream books online and some invisible angels deliver them to our desks within a few hours. So uh, uh, I, I cannot state um, or stress enough how much my research benefited from this fellowship and from the friendship and support I received from many, particularly Carolyn Brown, Mary Lou Reeker, Mary Jane Deeb, and Prosser Kivert. Um, so my book was published three months ago before Tunisia and Egypt's presidents were toppled by peaceful protesters. The events have taken the world community by surprise, perhaps more so than others, the jihadis are struggling to believe that such a development could ever have been achieved through peaceful means. This surprise is well-founded. Um, for years, the jihadis have convincingly argued that neither the dictators who ruled the Arab world would ever embrace genuine reform, nor would the democratic regimes in the West, led by the United States and its allies, would want such reforms because their interests are better served when dictators are in power. As far as the jihadis are concerned, Arab regimes and the US are, the, are two sides of the same coin. In the words of Ayman al-Zawahiri, one of the leading jihadi uh, uh, ideologues and leaders. The United States, he says, has only achieved its interest by spreading oppression and terrorism in, in the, at the hands of its Islamic allies. Similarly, Osama bin Laden was keen to highlight to the American public in one of his statements that, and I'm quoting him, the governments of our countries act as your agents and attack us on a daily basis. And our fight against these governments is not separate from our fight against you. The jihadis have thus determined that only jihad is the path towards genuine change in this world. Their jihad, they claim, is to fight to make God's law supreme on earth. That is their ultimate objective. Only then, they argue, can all Muslims, rulers, and citizenry be equally accountable to God's law. So my presentation today is based on the book, but I will end my presentation uh, uh, by discussing some of the implications of the recent events in Tunisia and Egypt and how my, they might play, play out in the jihadi world. So the book discusses the strengths and weaknesses of the jihadis by examining their ideology in view of the objectives that they set out to achieve. The book also explores the rise and fall of the Kharijites, a seventh century group that shares some of the ideological traits of today's jihadis and how they self-destructed precisely because of the same ideological weaknesses of today's jihadis. My presentation is largely devoted to the contemporary component and will therefore focus on the jihadis, but I would be happy to discuss the historical component of the book in the Q&A. To begin with, let me explain two basic points, namely, whom do I mean by jihadis and how I think we should understand the Islamic premise of their ideology. It would be misleading to understand jihadi ideology solely through a theological lens, even though jihadi discourse is exclusively defined by and premised on a religious paradigm. That is because first and foremost, Islam provides the jihadis with an alternative source of legitimacy to the nation state and the international world order as we know it. Central to the jihadi worldview is a rejection of the legitimacy of the nation state and other international political norms. Instead, they seek to base the legitimacy of their ideology on text and legal norms that precede the emergence of the nation state when great and powerful civilizations conducted their politics in the name of their founding religions like Islam and Christianity and when these great civilizations regulated war and peace on the basis of legal doctrines like just war or jihad. 
Now, this sets the jihadis apart not just from mainstream Muslims who adhere to Islam as a faith and see themselves as citizens of their respective states, but their rejection of the nation state also sets the jihadis apart from Islamist groups like Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and others. Islamists who share with the jihadis the belief that Islamic teachings of social justice are the solution to the malaise Muslims face today operate within the political processes of the nation state. They often form political parties and advance their agenda through contesting elections. By contrast, the jihadis reject the world order of nation states, believing it to be a continuation of Western imperialism through other means. Following the same logic, the jihadis reject political notions such as national sovereignty and any regional or international institutions such as the Arab League or the United Nations. I devote a chapter in the book in which I argue that we can no longer subsume Islamists with jihadis, and I discuss how and why Islamists have opted to pursue the electoral path and how and why jihadis have opted for a jihadocracy instead. So, the jihadis' exclusively religious paradigm is to be understood in relation to the rupture they want to have from the international world order. If jihad is the only solution, as they believe, it stands to reason that they cannot be part of the world order that monopolizes the legitimate use of violence in the hands of the state and denies them the right to resort to jihad. In other words, the jihadization of politics stems from their calculation that jihad represents the only course of action that is available to Muslims to rid themselves from their oppressive regimes. Accordingly, the jihadis are adamant that nothing should take precedence over jihad. For now, they say, Islam and jihad are one and the same. How then are we to assess the strength and weaknesses of this jihadi ideology? How does this exclusively religious paradigm advance their cause, and what are also the impediments that it places in their path? One of the key appeals of jihadism is its idealism. More precisely, its commitment to righteous causes that affect the plight of Muslims across different parts of the, of the world. The Islamic religious tradition, in particular the Quran, makes it incumbent upon believers to help fellow believers. Indeed, in modern political parlance, one may describe the Quran as a leftist document. It contains verses that are clearly intended to side with the poor and those disadvantaged by a hierarchical society. For example, power for the sake of obtaining material rewards is excoriated. And wealth for its own sake is a recipe for spending eternity in hell. The Quran is also unremitting in extolling those with the haves to help those who have not, even though it does not describe econo economic equality or communism amongst believers. These teachings have generated a rich and passionate language that appeals to the underdog. On the basis of the Quran, for example, the Prophet Muhammad, the founder of the religion, is said to have exhorted his, con his cousin and son in law Ali to give, and I'm quoting, to give priority to the common man ahead of the highborn, to the weak ahead of the strong, to women ahead of men. And because the Quran does not prescribe a hierarchical structure for the community, its message has lent itself to being interpreted by some Muslims to serve as the sole authority guiding their actions, sometimes even against the directives of existing temporal authorities. Thus, Islamic teachings of social justice provide the jihadis with ammunition to fight against the injustices they perceive Muslims around the world endure. The fact that jihadi leaders are themselves committed in word and in deed to jihad lends credibility to their cause. They believe themselves to be on the side of the underdog, on the side of the Palestinians, Kashmiris, Somalis, Iraqis, and others. The injustices these Muslims endure, they believe, the jihadis believe, is an assault on God's law and his justice. Thus, the jihadi's jihad is not to establish states or defend political parties or leaders. Rather, their loyalty is to God alone, and their jihad is waged in his service. That is what they call tawheed, or passion for divine unity, which does not allow any form of loyalty to anyone other than God. 
to ensure that their beliefs and actions are not corrupted by worldly interest, God is the focal point of the jihadis' social contract. They don't call it social contract, but they speak of terms like wala and bara. Wala refers to the solidarity jihadis must have towards, who, towards those who, like them, love God's friends and hate his enemies. And bara refers to those from whom jihadis must dissociate because they have compromised God's law by putting worldly concerns ahead of divine commands. In simple terms, the paradigm of wala and bara serve to designate those who are in and separate them from those who are out. This paradigm does not simply constitute the jihadi social contract, but it is also a global contract. Since the solidarities the jihadis must have towards one another is not regulated by the exclusive bureaucratic processes of the state, but simply on the basis of a shared creed, the paradigm of wala and bara allows the jihadis to cast their net globally. Everyone who shares the creed is invited to join in, and converts are welcome. This explains how Kenyans, Saudis, Afghans, Pakistanis, Australians, Americans, Yemenis, and others can forge common bonds that supplant national bonds. It's cosmopolitanism in action. In principle, the process of becoming a jihadi is far simpler than acquiring the citizenship of a state. In addition to idealism, the, key, the second key strength of jihadism is its individualism in interpreting religion. Put differently, the complete decentralization of interpreting religion. Jihadi ideologues have empowered the jihadi masses to interpret religion and jihad on an individual basis. This is not to say that they do not have their religious scholars. They do. And it's not to say that they don't believe in having a ruler. They do. But, they say, until a legitimate ruler is established, the jihadis do not want to centralize the interpretation of Islam, and especially of jihad, in the hands of the few who might easily be corrupted by the political establishment. They are distrustful of any religious scholar who is not supportive of jihad. In one interview, when Osama bin Laden was told that many religious scholars have denounced the attacks of 9-11, he swiftly responded that, and I'm quoting him, no official scholars' juridical decrees have any values as far as I'm concerned. End of quotation. For now then, the jihadis have a loose concept of authority and leadership. They are prepared to pledge allegiance only to those whom they deem to be true to the Islamic faith. The bond that unites jihadis is premised on what each one of them defines for himself what the true teachings of Islam are and whether he believes his fellow jihadis are committed to the same principles. Closely connected to this individualism in interpreting religion is a third key feature of jihadism, namely the conviction that Muslims today are engaged in defensive warfare or jihad ad dafa making their jihad not just lawful, but an individual duty, or fardain, incumbent upon each one of them. In my view, this, formula, this formulation of individualized jihad is the engine that drives global jihad, and appreciating its technical military meaning is critical. Before the advent of the Westphalian order of nation states, Muslim jurists, like their Christian counterparts, developed a legal theory of warfare distinguishing between offensive and defensive war. These two forms of warfare were designed to regulate peace between states and the conduct of warriors in times of war. In the case of Islam, offensive jihad was designed to address the potential needs of a strong Islamic state to wage war against other states while defensive jihad was designed to address the need of Muslims who are politically and militarily powerless after having been invaded in their own territories and without structures to author of authority to which they, ca they could have recourse. Thus, offensive jihad involved many elaborate regulations. Defensive jihad demanded none. For example, offensive jihad can only be undertaken at the command of a legitimate ruler. Further, a series of ethical and practical considerations must be met before a Muslim can volunteer for this type of jihad, taking into account his physical, financial, and family circumstances. This meant that under offensive circumstances, jihad was not open to all. Only mature, able-bodied males whose participation in it would not financially burden their families qualified to participate in jihad. As such, 
jihad was considered not as an individual, but as a collective duty, or fard kifaya. The doctrine of defensive warfare, on the other hand, was governed by looser dynamics, demanding little to no regulations. It was designed to take effect when Muslims were under attack in their territory and did not have the opportunity to seek anyone's permission to defend themselves. Thus, the medieval jurist made it lawful for Muslims to take up jihad under these circumstances on their own initiative, performing it as an individual duty, without awaiting the orders or permissions of any religious, political, parental, or in the case of married women, spousal authorities. Shihadi ideologues have molded the doctrine of defensive jihad into a contemporary global military program. As I noted earlier, the jihadis believe that today's jihad is not simply to repel a territorial attack, rather it is against both their own regimes, or what they would call the near enemy, and the West, the distant enemy, both of which the jihadis believe are complicit in the malaise that has befallen Muslims today. In essence, Defensive jihad provides jihadi ideologues and leaders a lawful umbrella to transcend the authority of the modern state and undermine any form of hierarchy or authority that may stand between the militant believer and jihad. This modern revolutionary appeal of defensive jihad was first invoked by Muhammad Abdus Salam Faraj in his book, The Neglected Duty of Jihad. Faraj was not a global jihadi. He was executed for his role in the assassination of Anwar al-Sadat. His formulation of individualized jihad on the basis of the medieval doctrine of defensive jihad, however, found a new lease on life when Abdullah Azam articulated the same doctrine for transnational purposes and when al-Qaeda ideologues and strategists used it to, ma to mount global jihad. The jihadis have argued that the doctrine applies not to Muslims resisting the occupation of their territory by non-Muslims, but also to Muslims who find themselves under attack by their own regimes, which the jihadis deem to be an apostasy of Islam because they do not govern according to the justice that Islam preaches. In many respects, the jihadis have plausibly rationalized their jihad and their adoption as well as adaptation of defensive jihad has furnished them with a legal or ideological ammunition to argue that the situation of Muslims today necessitates a call to arms requiring that all Muslims take up jihad. It is on that basis that the jihadis claim that their individualized jihad, which lacks the approval of political and religious establishments, is lawful. What we have then is an ideology that is premised on a sense of idealism, individualism in interpreting religious doctrines, and the right of the individual to resort to violence in defense of his religious beliefs. Now, while this ideolog ideology is in many ways appealing and responsible for the international profile the jihadis enjoy, ironically, it has also been the source of much of the problems and infighting that have weakened the jihadis. Not all jihadis are strategic in their vision and driven solely by a sense of political injustice. Some jihadis are driven to wage jihad by a desire to preserve doctrinal purity. Accordingly, they are more prone to wage jihad in, against other fellow Muslims, including jihadis, when they perceive them to have shirked their commitment to God's law. To illustrate this dimension of jihadism, let me cite an excerpt from a blogger on a jihadi forum who accuses none other than Al-Qaeda of unbelief. Here's the quotation. When they first emerged, referring to Al-Qaeda, the creed they professed and its components were obscure because they did not make them explicit. Instead, they were preoccupied with speeches about jihad, politics, and mobilizing media attention. Some of their speeches contained some symbolic references to divine unity and declarations acquitting themselves of anything that is worshiped besides God. For years, we thought well of them. When their speeches became more frequent, however, the details of their creed became clearer. When we put together that what we believe to be unbelief and error in their speeches, we realize that the founders of this organization and their followers do not belong to Islam. They do not even know what Islam is and do not know what, in, what unbelief is. 
They did not deny unbelief, nor dissociate themselves from it. Further, they did not dissociate themselves from the polytheist. Instead, they considered them to be their brethren." End of quotation. This obsession with the purity of doctrine is not limited to jihadi bloggers. It permeates some of the minds of some jihadis who are devoted to jihad on the battlefield. It is rarely based on an understanding of religious doctrines, but more often on a shallow understanding of religion. The Saudi religious scholar Musa Al-Karni remarked that many of the Arab youth who went to fight in Afghanistan had no religious education. Some of them, and I'm quoting him, had no knowledge of prayer or the ritual ablution. They came only to perform jihad. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq until he was killed in 2006, is said to have been a criminal before, the intu- before he turned into a jihadi. According to the journalist Nir Rosen, in the 1980s, al-Zarqawi found the correct way, served in Afghanistan, but still didn't have a lot of religious knowledge. Such doctrinally driven and narrow-minded jihadis are unwittingly empowered by jihadi strategists who downplay the value of religious education, lest it forestalls the Muslim youth's enthusiasm for militancy. In the words of of Abu Musab al-Suri, a a leading jihadi strategist, the only prerequisite is to embrace Islam, then fight to join the jihadis. This ambivalent approach to structured religious education has inevitably made jihadism a magnet for many who embrace jihad even before learning how to pray. To these nouveau Muslims, religious doctrine is an end in and of itself. For them, the emphasis is not so much on solidarities, solidarity with fellow Muslims, they are rather more preoccupied with those from whom they must dissociate. Some jihadis take this dissociation further, declaring those who do not share their beliefs to be unbelievers. This pronouncement is called takfir, and for some, it carries the license to shed the blood of fellow Muslims. These takfiris are a serious liability to jihadism. Given the idealistic and individualistic disposition of the jihadis, this declaration of takfir is not limited to being declared against non-jihadis. It is a pronouncement that could be declared by jihadis against other jihadis. Thus, for the sake of protecting the purity of the faith, the doctrinally driven jihadi fights the unbelievers, including fellow jihadis, whom he believes to have shirked their commitment to the faith on two fronts. He does so in word, through declaring takfir against them, and in deed through jihad. Takfir is not, making, is not about making friends and forging alliances. Rather, the mindset of takfir translates into a, an obsessive preoccupation with identifying enemies and eliminating them. Thus, whatever takfir achieves by way of purifying the faith from any perceived signs of unbelief, it negates by preventing any sustained unity among the group. So what is lacking in the jihadis' commitment to equality before God is a deeper conviction that they need, to borrow Hannah Arendt's words, to act in concert. In Islamic parlance, they lack an appreciation of the importance of the unity of the jama'ah, or the community, the cornerstone of Sunni Islam. Instead, the jihadi believes that he has entered into an individual covenant with God. He fights to make his God's law supreme on earth, and in re- return, God reserves a place for him in paradise. Thus, according to this, to this view, the true test of the jihadi is his willingness, when necessary, to dissociate himself from his group and its members and declare takfir against them if necessary. In so doing, he is armed with the conviction that while he loses his community, he gains the eternal life of his soul. The rejectionist mindset that some jihadis ultimately develop combines odd blends of idealism with sectarianism, commitment to equality with a lack of desire to be with equals, individualism with remarkable indifference even to death itself. The jihadis are trapped by their own idealistic goals. The more principled they are in their ideals, the more likely they will resort to takfir against fellow Muslims and against fellow jihadis. 
I indicated earlier that my study examined the rise and fall of the Kharijites, a 7th century group. I found that though there are many differences between the Kharijites and today's jihadis, still the Kharijites' fate is constructive. They too, they too were idealists in their vision of Islam and individualists in terms of the way they believed it should be applied. God, they said, has no special favorites. Everyone is equal in his eyes. So the Kharijites believed in a strictly egalitarian status among believers, an egalitarianism that transcended political and social hierarchies. The Quran they held was God's revelations to white and black, Arab and non-Arab, freeman and slave, male and female. In this respect, they were more egalitarian than their contemporary Muslims, who, as soon as Muhammad died, moved to accommodate the teachings of Islam to the existing social hierarchies of Arabia, privileging Arabs over others, and making the leadership of the Islamic community as a prerogative of Quraysh, the tribe of Muhammad. The Harijites' noble principles, however, were undermined by the manner in which they went, apply, they went about applying them. They took it upon themselves to purify the early community of Muslims from any perceived signs of unbelief, freely leveling takfir against fellow Muslims whom they deemed to have shirked their commitment to God's law. In their minds, once they decided that a fellow Muslim was deserving of the label of kafir or unbeliever, they deemed it lawful to kill him. And that is why takfir is a dangerous pronouncement, and that is why medieval and contemporary mainstream religious scholars caution against making the pronouncement. Before long, the Kharijites turned against each other. Whenever a disagreement arose among them over the meaning of a Quranic dictum, their inability to compromise led them to declare fellow Kharijites to be unbelievers and proceed to fight them. So the consequences of takfir were detrimental to their internal cohesion. Thus, despite being renowned as formidable fighters, so much so that they were on the verge of taking all over Arabia, they self-destructed. So jihadism's very strength prevents it from functioning in concert, to concentrate, organize, and monopolize violence to meet its objective of establishing an Islamic state or caliphate. The consequences of this worldview are detrimental to achieving any form of sustainable unity within a group, let alone on a global scale. Potentially, the jihadi can direct his jihad against not just the infidels, the apostate rulers, and their collaborators, but also against fellow jihadis. Thomas Hobbes' apocalyptic narrative of life in a lawless state of nature as nasty, brutish, and short may still be an optimistic description of what jihadism can lead to. Parts of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan now provide the living reality of the freewheeling of jihad and takfir. So jihadi ideologues can applaud themselves for mobilizing Muslims across the globe to join the caravan of jihad, but they have ultimately failed to distinguish between jihad and power. More precisely, they have failed to distinguish between what Arendt observed as the instrumental character of violence on one hand and power, that is, the human ability not just to act, but to act in concert, on the other hand. Accordingly, the jihadis' chances of securing the eternal life in paradise are probably greater than their chances of establishing a caliphate in this world. I shouldn't end this talk without saying a few words about how the events in Tunisia and Egypt might affect the jihadis. I think that these events are more than perplexing for the jihadis. On the one hand, it is a dream come true, the very dream that set them on the path of jihad in the first place. On the other hand, they are not active players in the realization of this dream, nor can they be, so long as they stick to their jihadi principles. While the jihadis, as I said in this presentation, cannot but reject the legitimacy of positive laws and the democratic process, the Egyptians and the Tunisians are demanding nothing less. This represents, I think these events represent a turning point. If these countries and others that might follow suit transition into functioning democracies, then we can expect a serious reduction in the appeal of jihadism, especially to aspiring jihadis who now believe that there is an alternative to jihad. However, if no meaningful change emerges, then jihadism 
will enjoy a longer lease on life if jihadis get to say, we told you so. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Thank you. Al-Zawahiri or, Harry or, or uh, bin Laden and so forth must sit there in their splendid isolation and say, why aren't we succeeding? Why can't we get together and do what we want to do, which is bring about world revolution or a great Islamic caliphate? I mean, I mean they, can't be, they can't be so, what do I want to say, so uninformed or stupid as to see the, the, the weakness of their own movement? No, the thing is, it's not about... I think it's a catch-22 for them. And I think that this is, that this is a, a stupidity on their part. I think the reason why they don't want to act in concert is because you would need to centralize decisions in the hands of some. And if you are going to centralize the decisions, you're not going to have the global jihad. You don't want to give more power to leaders who might be corrupted. So of course they have small leaders, but some of these leaders are descending, dissenting from the movement, or they could actually become more extremist from other members in the movement. What they are after is actually, when they talk about jihad as an individual duty, they are calling on people who have no contact with them. They are calling on people who are behind their computer screens, who could be either uh, uh, um, in, in the United States, or if their message reaches them in the mountains of Afghanistan to appeal to something common that you don't need leaders to bring about. So this is, this is why they've been able to mobilize people from different parts of the world. They've turned it into an individual duty. The question is, what can they do with that? What is it that they can achieve with that? And, and here, ultimately, where the failure of jihadism is and the real weakness of jihadism. It's their strength because they can, they can be so unpredictable and you don't know who is going to be a jihadi or not. But at the same time, as, as Max Weber said in, in about, about the state, you can only bring about a state if you can actually monopolize the legitimate uh, um, use of physical force. Um, they can't, I mean, if they monopolize it, they lose global jihad. So it's a catch-22 for them. So they can, they can achieve revenge. They can, they can make themselves be present on the global scale. They can, they can get the United States to change its security apparatus. They could get, they could get people to a, a war of attrition, if you like, to spend enormous amount of money on security and, and, and even, even infringe on people's personal liberties. They can do all that, and they know it. But can they achieve an Islamic state? Can they, can they make God's law reign supreme on earth through an Islamic state? That they can't, and they won't be able to, so long as they, they can't concentrate violence. Um, Andy Rohr, um, open source intelligence researcher in the DC metro area. With regards to the principle of jihad and the traditional um, ideas of uh, the religious principles concerning to both Sunni and Shia um, believers, which one, through the research you've conducted, are more likely to use jihad? Would a Sunni or a Shia be more likely to call on jihad to uh, achieve their principles? Thank you. Uh, I've, I've focused on, on Sunni jihadis, Sunni groups. Um, I think the dynamic between the Sunni militant groups and the, Shi and the Shiite militant groups are quite different. And the, the Sunni groups are driven by principles. The Shiite groups are driven by leaders. Uh, um, you, can, you can count on negotiating with a Shiite leader um, and, and, if, and if you were to get something with him, you may be able to get a deal. 
it's not very clear with Sunni extremists because if members of that Sunni jihadi group is going to disagree with the leader, then they could open their own shop and take jihad into their own direction. Thank you for coming today. This was very interesting. You talked about the, the Hirajites, you know, of years ago, and then, you know, for hundreds of years after that, even though they have failed, you know, the armies of Islam rolled across Africa and half of Europe and Asia. So even if there's a failure in a smaller sense, you know, will we see an end to the violence, you know, in our, you know, in the near future from the jihadists, you know, on both sides as you've described them? Um. It's, it's a different, I mean, what, what happened after the Harijites, it's a, it's a, different, it's a different use of violence. It's, a, it's, it's a jihad through conquest of states, just as other civilizations have done. I think the Harijites were interesting for me because I started, when I first started my research, many people, many commentators were actually comparing the Harijites with the jihadis. And they were comparing them for the wrong reason. They, they just wanted to denounce them because the Harijites are not popular amongst Muslims. All mainstream Muslims say, you know, the Harijites are outsiders to Islam. And in order for these commentators to dissociate themselves from the jihadis, they started saying, oh, the jihadis are Harijites. There are many, many differences between the Harijites and, and the jihadis. But what I thought was interesting between the two and what really is constructive to learn from the Harishites and about their fate is precisely their idealism, individualism, and the possibility to resort to takfir. Because this is really what turned them against each other, and that's what got them to, to self-destruct. The, the, the civilization of Islam that grew after the seventh century, um, uh, uh, when, when you know, it, it, it expanded not on the basis of that narrow rigidity turning inward, it was reason of state. It was just as other empires expand. Would we have, um, you know, how far are the jihadis going to go? I think, I, I don't think that we could expect them to end anytime soon. Um, but sometimes we've given them, I think, some of, some of the policies that, that were made have given them a longer lease on life. Um, I think based on some of the research that I've done in the book. For instance, there were many, many disagreements over doctrine in Afghanistan. I think uh, um, what seems to happen is that when they are concentrated in an area, they find out quite a lot of the differences with each other. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm working on a document at the moment uh, by, by a leading Al-Qaeda leader in in East Africa, and he claims that a takfiri had tried to assassinate bin Laden in Sudan. So what we might, if we think of bin Laden as an extremist, he's, he's much more of a strategist and pragmatist than some of the people. So I think some of the policies have given them longer lease on life. Uh, I do think, though, at the moment, Tunisia and Egypt have opened a new phase in history. And I think this is a great opportunity um, to show, I think it's too late for some of the jihadis who are in the fold, possibly. Some of them might, I don't know, but I would say it, it's unlikely. But for those aspiring jihadis, I think if they can see that jihad is not necessarily the solution and that there is something else that could be done through nonviolence. I think this represents a very, very important turning point. Hi. Um, I think the, the Kharijites are very interesting historical precedent that we all sort of bring up, but I wonder how important they are other than the fact that they're Muslims but you know, 12, 13, 1400 years ago, 
all that you have described about the, jih uh, the jihadis, their individualism, their idealism, their decentralization, their ability to act in a situation in which the state is no longer an actor, all of this reminds me of globalization. Pardon, could you say that? All of this reminds me of globalization. I mean, I mean uh, so what would you say that jihadism is an aspect of current globalization in which the sovereign nation state disappears? in which national boundaries and flows of capital across national boundaries are actually, in other situations, celebrated. So uh, perhaps jihadism is much more a function of the t of 21st century uh, political transformations of, of globalization that we, in other circumstances, would applaud. Uh, the other point, I think, not, uh, Jihadis were never really a factor in Tunisia. And where they are active today in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan, the, the key feature of all those places is some sort of, on some level of state collapse, often brought on by war. And the fact that that war comes from us is part of the, uh, part of the part of the mix as well. Uh, so I wonder, you know, in terms of, uh, they, may not, they may not have an answer, and I, I completely agree with you on that one, but whether uh, there is any hope of change in which extern factors external to Islam, such as the US military, are part of the explanation. Whether the external whether we can uh, we can have a proper explanation of jihadism in which factors external to Islam are also not considered. Oh, sure, sure. Um, it, let me just uh, uh, go through some of the points that you made uh, in terms of the you know the the difference between jihadis and kharijites. You're absolutely right, and and I I found that that. There are so many differences between the two. But on the question of the central characteristics between the two, the idealism, individualism, and individualism to resort to violence, I thought that this, this aspect was constructive. And I think the way the Kharijites resorted to takfir and using violence against fellow Muslims, including against fellow believers, fellow Kharijites, uh, uh, there are many similarities with some of jihadi groups who actually resort to takfir against fellow jihadis. We've seen them in, in, in Afghanistan, we've seen them in Iraq, uh, 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 we've seen them in, in Pakistan. Uh, uh, they are not really widely reported. Some of us who actually study some of the discourses that are being uh, uh, taken out and the texts that get written by some jihadis against other jihadis, you can see the, the importance of takfir and how detrimental takfir is to the, to the unity and to the unity of the jihadi. So I, on, on, this, on this aspect, yes, there are many uh, uh, centuries that, that there's, a, there's a long gulf between the two groups, but I think it's, it's, we, it is some, there is something constructive to be learned from, from the Kharijites. Jihadism as the 21st century, of course it is. Uh, um, in, in many ways, they've used all the modern means of the 21st century. They've used the media. They've, used, they've taken charge of modern communication to, to advance their own, their, own, uh, um, their own cause and, and, and take ownership of